Good morning and welcome to Unity. My name is Jenna Breedlove and I am the summer fellow this year at Unity. I go to school in Whitworth University up in Spokane, Washington, and we have a program there called the Summer Fellowship Program, which allowed me to spend my summer here at Unity with you all. I was so excited that Pastors David and Dana invited me to preach this morning after the last six weeks of shadowing them and learning what ministry full-time looks like here. But first, some announcements. First, Pastor David is not here today because he is on paternity leave. We're just waiting for that call, for that little baby girl to be born, but he will be out for the next three weeks, so keep him and his wife Sarah in your prayers. He'll be all the way from the office, so if you have a pastoral need, reach out to Pastor Dana, Henry, or any of the church staff. Next, next Sunday we begin our three-week volunteer fair. It'll be in the fellowship hall between services, so our Unity Ministry teams will be on hand to tell you about their projects and the ways that you can get involved. So please take a little bit of time at 10.30 next week and for the next three weeks to see everything that is happening around Unity and how you can get involved in a ministry that, you, that speaks to you. I'm also so happy to tell you that coffee and cookies will be back next week between services. So grab a coffee and a snack and head through that volunteer fair. The next installment of our Walking in Their Shoes video series is up today on our church website. As part of our initiative as a Matthew 25 church, we are asked to look at the places in our lives where we may carry bias or misunderstanding or simply different experiences and viewpoints. This month, our video conversation takes place with a Jew and a Muslim as they share their experiences in North Carolina. So let's watch this short clip as we prepare for that video. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth workshop of Walking in Their Shoes. Today we'll be exploring the topic of interfaith and listening to the stories of those who are not practicing Christians. To be a, really, to be a good religion, you have to have an open mind. What I felt really connected to Judaism, what it was, was, you know, about trying to heal the world, trying to have a voice for, you know, uh, marginalized groups of people that, that can't for whatever reason or aren't able to, to share their own voice and charity and... Their behavior after 9-11, before and after, to show because their parents kind of like I emphasize that, that when you go to school, you're a Muslim, you're different than other kids, show who you are. Act the way you act, the way, the behave, the way the Islam taught you to behave. I, I, I would hate to say, but run-ins with very devout Christians. Well, it's a start. Mm -hmm. It is a start. Yeah, yeah. Maybe another state hear about this and then they will do it, so we'll see. some prayer requests as we hold each other in prayer this week including David and Sarah please remember Trip Vivaret whose father passed away this week and also the family of Joyce Waringa as they hold a private memorial service for her at the Columbarium on August 5th and now our children's director Bailey has some announcements for us good morning I hope you're all doing great this morning as Jenna mentioned, we have a volunteer fair coming up, and it just so happens that I am also in need of some volunteers. So um, it's already August, which is crazy. So that means I have a month to get some Sunday school teachers to start teaching in September. Our Sunday school kickoff will be September 5th, and so I am looking for some wonderful people to teach Sunday school this fall. Even if you feel like you can only commit one Sunday a month or two Sundays, that's okay. Let me know if you're interested in that, and I will be happy to give you some more information. We have a sign-up sheet in the gathering area, and you can also reach out to me and email me at bailey at unityprez.org. And um, I'm also looking for anyone who uh, to sit in the nursery. 
we still haven't found a nursery coordinator yet, so I'm also looking for nursery volunteers. And with Sunday school kickoff coming up, we are updating our classrooms in the education building. And so tomorrow and Tuesday, we're going to be painting those. So if you would like to come paint with us, we will start at 9 a.m. So um, just let me know if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that. And now let us stand and sing together our opening song. be seated. Now we will have our time with our children. So children are welcome to come forward. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good. Okay, so do you have chores you have to do at home ever? What kind of chores do you have to do? Clean your room? Sweep the floor? Mm, unload the dishwasher. That's fun. 
We didn't even have a dishwasher growing up, so I had to wash dishes when I was your age. Not fun. Any other chores you have to do? I bet you all have to clean your room like Frankie, right? Okay, have you ever, has your mom or dad ever said, hey, I really need you to wash the dishes, and you said, yeah, I'll do that, but then you didn't do it. Have you ever done that? What about clean your room? You said you were going to clean your room, and then you didn't do it. You always obey? Oh, well, I can tell you, when I was a kid, I sometimes would say, yeah, I'll do that, and then I didn't. And let me tell you, it did not make my parents happy. Not at all. But have you ever, have your parents ever said, will you clean your room? And you said, no, I'll do that later. I'm not going to do that right now. But then you felt so bad that you decided to clean your room after all. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, me either. I was always scared to tell my mom no. Yeah. But sometimes we do that. Sometimes we say one thing, but we do the other, don't we? Yeah. Um, sometimes they call that actions speak louder than words. Have you ever heard that phrase? That actions speak louder than words? You heard it in a movie? Very cool. Yeah, so in today's story, Jesus tells a story about a man that had two sons, and he asked them to go out and work in the vineyard, and one son said, sure, I'll do that, but then he didn't. But then the other son, he said, no, I'm not going to go do that for you. But then he changed his mind, and he decided to go out and work after all. Now, which son do you think the father was happy with? The one that said no but decided to go after all? You would be correct. No, and why is that? Yep, because actions speak louder than words, right? See, that's what Jesus wants us to learn from this. Jesus wants us to do what he asks us to do, even if we might be hesitant, even if we might say no at first. The fact that we do it after all is important. What he doesn't want us to do is to say, sure, I'll do that, but don't. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor, of course he wants us to say, sure, I love my neighbor, but he also wants us to actually love our neighbors, okay? So try to remember that today. Remember that actions speak louder than words, and it's important to obey when asked to do something like that, even cleaning your room or washing the dishes, all right? So let's, well, one day you'll get a chance, I promise. All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for teaching us to be obedient towards you, and please help us to remember that our actions speak louder than our words. Help us to always do as you say, even when we say no at first. And thank you for loving us. We love you. Amen. All right, so you're going to go to Sunday school with Miss Annie today. All right? You can go ahead.
If you don't mind, I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather together to hear your word. May I speak clearly this morning and stay true to your teachings. Amen. We are in for a doozy this morning, folks. (laughs) So as I began this process of knowing I was going to speak on a parable and trying to decide which one I was going to use, I had to make all these lists and figure out what was already selected and what was interesting to me. And I decided to go with one that I didn't know very well, that I hadn't really heard preached much on before. So I cross out Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, and we even have a picture of my desk for you this morning up on the screen. So this is actually my desk. It's in Pastor Dana's office with the lovely Welcome Jenna sign that the Unity staff made me when I first got here. And it is covered in sticky notes, and that's organized. It ha- there's groupings. I know where everything is. There's different categories. So there's like the blue ones, and then there's the calendar ones, and there's project ones, and there were multiple on all my thoughts on this sermon (laughs) for the last six weeks. So I actually did. I crossed off the ones on my list that I knew I wasn't going to use. And then I came across this one in Matthew that I really didn't know very well and felt really, felt It felt different, and it was situated between two really significant moments in Jesus' story. So I was really intrigued by it and decided to go with it, and I had no clue what I was getting into. This parable that we're going to study this morning is chock full of subversive language, history, context. So I'm really excited to share just a little bit of what I've learned from this story with you all today. So hold on to your hats. Now let's dig in. First, some context. In the first century Jewish world, culture was based on honor and shame. Each action communicated your place in the world, in society. We've heard this language before. Remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Dana talked about the parable of the wedding feast, and Jesus was saying, sit at the lower seat so that you may be moved to a place of honor rather than taking the highest seat and incurring shame upon yourself by being asked to move to a lower position. Each action creates honor and shame. So people grew up learning these rules. They knew what this was about, even if they didn't name it. You respect your elders, you do what you're told, you be respectful. People had to be so careful in word and deed so that they didn't incur shame upon themselves or their family. Do you feel that tension rising in your chest about having to be so conscious of this? These are the ears with which Jesus' audience would be listening to his stories. So this parable takes place on the Monday after Palm Sunday. Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey after three years of ministry. Crowds have gathered to hear him speak at the temples. The religious leaders, or the Pharisees, have also gathered but to confront Jesus, to try to catch him in order to arrest him. But these crowds that have gathered fully believe Jesus to be the Messiah, and they are ready to riot if anything happens to him. So there's tension here. There's months, years of conflict building up between all these systems in society, religious, political, socioeconomic, all this tension building up, and Jesus is at the center of it all. So the Pharisees confront Jesus about his authority to heal on the Sabbath and to do the things that he's been doing. To which Jesus responds with a question about John the Baptist's authority. Do you remember John the Baptist, according to the Gospel of Luke, was a man born just before Jesus who proclaimed the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. And he was baptizing people into the kingdom of God, which went against Jewish law, which is why the Pharisees didn't like what he was doing. So they confront Jesus about his authority. Jesus responds, asking them about John's authority. 
But these crowds that have gathered in support of Jesus also support John the Baptist in his mission. So, the Pharisees, for fear of what the crowds may do, can't really answer Jesus' question. So when they can't answer, Jesus continues with this parable. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. So Jesus asked, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, the Pharisees must answer. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Let's break that down. So Jesus says to the first one, verse 29, I will not, but then he went and worked in the field. This would have been a shameful act. To refute his father to his face would have been disrespectful, dishonorable. This son would have brought shame upon himself and his his father. The second son, verse 30, I will, sir, but then he didn't go. Despite this disobedience, this would not have brought shame. He didn't bring dishonor by refuting his father. He was saving face, which would have been a more honorable action. Now, this parable is not a parenting lesson. Both sons are in the wrong. It's important to know that. The story is directed at Jesus' audience, the Pharisees. Since they've lived in this culture of honor and shame, these are the ears with which they'd be listening to the story. But Jesus doesn't ask about honor and shame. He asks in verse 31, which son did what his father wanted? Which son was obedient? So the Pharisees have to respond the first. The first did what the father wanted. To which Jesus replies in verse 31, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus has been incurring shame upon himself his entire life. He was born of an unwed woman. He's from Galilee. He rode in on a donkey. He touches the sick and the lame. He eats with tax collectors and prostitutes. And even within a week of this point of this story, he will incur the most shameful death a first century person could, beaten and hung naked on a cross for all to see. These are shameful acts according to the culture. But every act of shame that Jesus incurs upon himself is actually also an act of obedience to the will of God. Now, shame and sin are not the same thing. Jesus' actions are shameful according to the culture's eyes, but he never sinned. None of those actions are sinful, but the culture, the society, deemed them shameful. So this parable that Jesus tells about these sons is elevating those in positions of shame. Prostitutes and tax collectors are the lowlifes of society. They are in the pits of shame. But they're the ones that are held in righteousness. They're the ones entering the kingdom of God. Why? Because they're acting in obedience. They're living in such great shame, but they hear the message of John the Baptist, and they repent. They believe. Desperate for mercy and forgiveness, they repent of these sinful ways of greed, sexual immorality. They repent. They step into what God is actively doing through John and then through Jesus. They're acting in obedience out of great faith, believing this message. 
They're able, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they're able to recognize Jesus' authority and repent. So they leave behind these sinful ways. They're acting in obedience out of faith. The Pharisees, on the other hand, do not act out of active, authentic faith. Now, it's important to note that the Pharisees and the religious leaders are not evil. These are not the villains of the Bible or of Jesus' story. They're just people. We know that the history of the Israelites is full of disobedience, but now they're trying. They've gotten to this point, and so they're creating these systems of religious leaders to help guide the community, to help them follow the law better. These Pharisees, they cling to the words because they love God and they want to do right. They want to obey to these rules. So they cling to this love in order to try to cling to God. But John the Baptist comes and they don't recognize God's authority in him. Jesus comes and they do not recognize him as the Son of God. The Pharisees have wrapped themselves in this culture of honor and shame and have mixed it into their laws. They've confused God's call to keep the Sabbath, for example, with the shame that would be incurred upon them by touching the sick and helping the poor. So they've mixed tradition and law and culture, and it's clouding their vision of what God is doing through Jesus. They've sinned by neglecting God's people in order to maintain their honor. They have allowed their words to become more important than their actions. This has caused them to be hypocritical by preaching this love of God without actually acting on love of people. How have we done this? How have we mixed shame and sin? Only a few decades ago was interracial marriage so shameful that it was also illegal. Even now, interracial marriage or children of divorce that are getting married carry this stigma. But this stigma is not a reaction to sinful actions. This stigma is a reaction to shameful actions. So what are the things that we consider taboo and shameful as also sinful? when in reality, perhaps we're missing the point. Back, go back to the parable. The first son in the story, the one that changed his mind, this is the prostitutes and the tax collectors. The second son, the one who claimed to act but didn't, represents the Pharisees, the religious leaders. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are living in sin. They're not following the laws of God. Greed, sexual immorality, they're not, they're not doing the laws. But they recognized it. They believed Jesus' message of forgiveness and mercy. The Pharisees claimed to follow God, but did not act on his most central command to love him and love his people. To feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to care for the orphan and the widow, This parable is pointing at the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. So if you look on the screen, there's a visual to try to understand this idea of shame and sin being separate. So we have the the bubble of sin in which everyone, everyone has fallen short of the glory of the God. We know this. So Jesus is the only one on the outside of that bubble of sin. We have these two bubbles on the inside, honor and shame. So the Pharisees and the second son, the one that didn't follow through with what he said, they're in honor. Their sin looks like hypocrisy and pride. But according to the culture, they're doing an honorable thing by saving face or they're letting their words create this honorable status. Then there's the shame bubble. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the first son that, that dishonors his father, they bring shame upon themselves, and they're under sin. Their sin is bringing their shame. Jesus never sinned, but his actions have kept him in that bubble of shame. His actions 
are act of obedience to the will of God, which is why they were never sons. So again, both sons are in the wrong. Both groups are still in that sin bubble. We have all been both sons. The story is not a question about which son are you. We have all been both at different points in time. The first son, the one who dishonors his father by saying no, but then eventually goes and does it. Every teenager has done this. I've not been a parent, but I've been a teenager. Go back to those years, those teenage years. Maybe you never outright talked back to a parent, but did you think about it? Did you sass them behind their back? I know I did. My mother's even here today, and as much as I would like to claim to be this perfect angel, I'm sure she would beg to differ. (laughs) One of the things that would cause tension was keeping my room clean. Bailey hit it right on the spot. Keeping my room clean was a pain. I liked my space generally picked up, but I hated being told what to do. So I would plan to keep my room clean, to clean it up. You've seen my desk. That's organized. That's clean to me. (laughs) I'd prepare to clean my room up, and then one of my parents would say, you should clean your room. Well, now I don't want to, and now I'm not going to. So I wouldn't yell at them or, or outright talk back to them. I'd certainly try to make my case for why it should stay the way it was. I like it this way. I know where everything is. It's my stuff. Why can't I do what I want with it? But then I'd want it clean anyway. I was planning to clean it anyway. So then I would just go ahead and do it. Maybe you acted this way as a teenager. Or maybe you know a teenager that acts this way. Or consider the other son. The one who says yes, but then doesn't actually go through with it. I've been this kid too. Whether it's just saying yes to appease my parents about cleaning my room, even though I know I wasn't going to do it. Or maybe it's making an empty promise to catch up with someone, knowing I'm not going to follow through. Or maybe it's offering to pray for someone I end up prioritizing other things and eventually just forget. Or maybe it's mixing these these things that are taboo with things that are sinful in order to boost my pride as the one who's doing it right, the honorable one. I'm guilty of all these things, too. But just as the tax collectors and and the prostitutes are called, just as the Pharisees are called, we are called to recognize our hypocrisy, to repent, to act in obedience out of faith. We're called to see what God is actively doing, to let go of the past. Now I know repent is a controversial word. Maybe you're thinking of the people on the street corners with the signs, yelling at everybody that they're all sinners. Or maybe you associate repentance with this wrathful Old Testament God. God is a loving God, always has been, always will be. Repentance is not this emotionally charged event where you have to plead your case and beg for mercy and hope you will be forgiven. You will be forgiven if you confess from the heart. Our God is a gracious and merciful God. Repentance is about a deliberate change of ethical action. It's about recognizing this path you're on and making a 180. It's about recognizing your hypocrisy and making a conscious effort to change our behavior. So to emphasize, traditions and laws are not sinful. The Torah, the Old Testament, these were created to guide the Israelites in this community of faith. The Torah was not sinful, but the religious leaders got lost in the execution. They neglected God's most central command to love him and love others. These rules are helpful. We like structure. But we break the rules all the time. David Loewe is a pastor at North Decatur Presbyterian Church in Georgia, and he wrote a commentary on this parable. 
And in that commentary, he writes, no church can exist in which every person consistently breaks the rules and comes back saying, I'm sorry, expecting to be fully restored. It would be mayhem and moral chaos. However, this story is not about church order. It simply says that no church can exist if people who consistently break the rules and come back saying, I'm sorry, are not fully restored to membership. For the new church, obediently following the rules requires forgiveness. We are hypocritical, disobedient people. But we serve a merciful and loving God. I invite you to consider the ways that you have failed. Failed to love him well. Failed to love others well. What do you need to let go of? What is keeping you from loving God and loving people well? Remember, traditions and laws are not sinful, but has the way things have always been done clouded your vision of what God is actively doing and changing? What are the things that you consider shameful but are actually not sinful? What do you need to repent for and step into a new form of obedience? Don't shy away from this. It's not easy work to be introspective and honest with yourself. But I encourage you to pause and reflect, to put in this effort, to consider how committed you are to being transformed by Christ. And know that this is a lifelong journey, but it starts with one step of repentance. So I invite you, invite the Holy Spirit in to reveal to you the ways in which God wants you to grow. But do not despair here. For the kingdom of God has come near in Christ Jesus. Believe the good news and accept this forgiveness and mercy of God and step into faith, obeying God's call. Obey him and his call to love him and love others. Amen. Thank you, Jenna, for that message and for really just picking a, a very multi-layered and difficult parable. I think you truly unpacked all of that for us, and there's a lot of good life lessons in there for each of us. We are blessed to have you as an intern this summer, so thank you. It is now time for our offertory, and whether you are worshiping in person, whether you are worshiping online, there are a variety of ways that you can make your contribution to the church, and all of those ways are listed up here on the screen for you, so I encourage you to utilize whichever giving source is most appropriate for you.
Today we gather together to partake in the Lord's Supper. If you're worshiping with us in person, the communion cup is in the pew in front of you. And if you're worshiping with us today online, take a moment, if you haven't done so already, to gather the elements, bread of life and juice or water. We come to this table together today to remember Christ's sacrifice for us. His death on a cross to die for our sins. And we remember the forgiveness that rests at the center of the sacrament. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he had a meal with the disciples. And during that meal, he took the bread that was at the table. And he lifted it up towards the heavens and he thanked God for that bread. And then he broke it. And he offered it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup that was on the table. And he also offered it to the disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Friends, whenever we eat this bread, whenever we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of our risen Lord until he comes again. The body of Christ. The cup of of salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the bread, which is your body, and the cup, which is your blood. Thank you for your presence at this table and for your life giving force that sustains us and nourishes us. We are grateful for the relationship we get to have with you, for your words that continue to teach us and inspire us to new heights as Christians. We thank you for the stories of the Bible that continue to speak truth into our lives this present day. May we hear your story in Matthew with new ears, and learn to heed the wisdom in order to follow you and continue to be transformed by you. We thank you for your sacrifice, for your mercy, Lord God. We thank you that we can rest in the knowledge that we will be forgiven, that we don't have to guess on your grace, on your mercy. We can rest confidently in your forgiveness. And we thank you for all that you do for us. And we pray all these things together through your son's holy and precious name who taught us to say by taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now stand for our closing hymn.
benediction is a gift. May you receive this blessing with open arms. May you go from here confident in the forgiveness and the mercy of Christ Jesus, knowing the sacrifice he has made for you and the mercy and grace he has for you. Rest in the grace of Christ Jesus, the love of the Father, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.